So I think about the time when I first began to write and what was going on in my life at the time and why I did it. It was insane. This was about 20 years ago when I was, I was 26 years old. That was about 20 years that I started to write and it was the craziest time to start a new career direction. I had three kids under five, one with Down syndrome. That was a little extra time. I had a chronic pain disorder. Anyone else have fibromyalgia? Yay for pain! Me and one other woman were like, oh. So, um, and I was going to school, getting my doctorate, and I had a job. I mean, it was not the time to start a new career. But one day I just felt a really strong compulsion to write. Actually, my life was changed by one question from another person. And think back into your life to the questions that changed you. This was the one that changed me. Someone asked me, when was the last time you read a book for fun? And I remember thinking, fun, fun. What is this fun you speak of? <laughs> we do not have this in my country. <laughs> I was like, when's the last time? Fun. And then I thought, that's right, you know? I used to read for fun. When I was a kid, that's all I did. So I went to the grocery store with my kids that day, and I bought a paperback copy of Jurassic Park. And I, you know, was not highbrow literature. Put my kids to bed that night, started reading Jurassic Park, did not close it until seven o'clock the next morning. What a fun ride. And I closed the book and went to wake up my kids knowing something that I had actually known all along but hadn't been aware of mentally. I'd never articulated it. And that was that I wanted to write something that someone would read for fun. And I hadn't thought about that for years. Are you kidding? I'd been in the Ivy League and nothing was fun about the writing I did there. I promise you. But I also was having, you know, some struggles of my own in life with a child with a disability and trying to be a working mom and all that. And so I also wanted to write stuff that would help people. So that was why I sat down, and that was why I started to write. And nobody cared, and nobody wanted a manuscript from me, and I didn't know if anyone would ever read it. But something made me do it. And I, I came to call this your own North Star, this still point inside you that knows your destiny and never stops whispering to you about it. If you find the North Star in the sky, it's. It's not the brightest star. I'll point it out to people and they'll always say, well, it's so little. Yeah, it is little, but it's the one star in our northern hemisphere that doesn't seem to move in the sky. Anytime you find it, you know you're headed north, right? And then the book that I wrote based on this, Finding Your Own North Star, actually sold pretty well in South Africa where you can't see the North Star. So I was down there doing a book tour going, sorry, but there is a still point inside you that is calling you to your destiny. So I always think that this must be the way a caterpillar feels when, you know, it's been born, it comes out of the little egg and it's a little caterpillar and it eats and eats and eats and it becomes a bigger caterpillar. But then one day, after a lifetime of changing in one way, just becoming bigger, the caterpillar does something completely different I, when my oldest daughter was two, she used to say several times a day, I have an idea. And it was always the same, a birthday party. I have an idea, a birthday party. And so I always picture caterpillars just munching along until they reach the critical mass and then saying, I have an idea. I'm going to make myself a tiny sleeping bag from my saliva. And so they do, they, <laughs> they've never done it before. They wrap themselves up in silk. And then what happens is they don't go in there and just get a slender waist and grow their legs out and grow wings. It's not just a makeover, okay? <laughs> the first thing that happens in the cocoon is that the, the caterpillar sheds its skin and then completely dissolves into a liquid. If you cut open the chrysalis, you don't find an animal in there at all. It's just soup, but it's alive. And there are cells in it called imago cells that have the image of the butterfly in them and they reconstruct every cell into a butterfly. Totally different animal. It's like taking a huge palace of Legos, taking apart every Lego, and then reconstructing it into like a cityscape that requires exactly the same number of Legos. 
It's truly a miraculous process. And it's something I believe that human beings go through too. We go through periodic changes. You know, the kids get older, um, we get more education or we get a little more money or whatever. That's like the caterpillar growing bigger. But then there are times, and we go through this more than once, when something happens and it makes us go into a cocoon and dissolve. And what we dissolve is our identity. And some of you I know know what I'm talking about because most of you, I don't see any kids. So I'm assuming that everybody here has made that transition from identifying as a child to identifying as an adolescent to identifying as an adult. Some of you have made the transition from single to married, right? Some of you have made the transition from childless to parent and so on and so forth. So you've transformed your whole identity at some point in your life. And the, this is really an unfamiliar process to human beings because we try to set our course and then stick to it. We want to just be bigger.